we will be talking about issues that seem to plague the African continent, that seem to dog us every time we try to raise our heads above the parapet and achieve things. We're going to talk about issues like perceptions, prejudices around risk, around corruption, around lack of skills, around the credit worthiness of institutions in Africa. And we are going to probe this from the softer side of things, as in why is it that the continent still suffers and what is it going to take for the continent to prosper? Because at the end of the day, it's home to 2 billion people, almost what? 20% of world's humanity. And one of the things that I would like to put up front, just to set the stage, is that thanks to the history of the world, and this is not a blame game, but thanks to the history of the world, the way the world has evolved, Africa does have a terrible legacy. And various ways has been put together to explain Africa's challenges. All I can tell you is that if you look around the world, you will see African talent everywhere. Doctors, nurses, teachers, bankers. I think 15% of the National Basketball Association players in the US were born in Africa. When I was watching the Soccer World Cup in Boston in 2018, Belgium and France was playing. And somebody asked me, which African team is this? Right? So we are not talking about the lack of talent. We are talking about how to channel that talent. They all have, the first thing in common is, they grew up on the African continent. They were born in the African continent. They studied in the African continent. They started their working lives in the African continent. And then they went global. But they have another thing in common. That as much as they went global, they also kept their ties in Africa and are continuing to do so much, both from a personal point of view and a professional point of view on Africa. So if there is ever going to be a better collection of people to take us through the challenges of the people matter in Africa. I don't think there are any. So we're going to explore tonight that issue. The issue of skills, issue of people, and issue of how we harmonize, channelize, and develop Africa. So I'm going to come to you, Uche, uh, because uh, you flew in all the way from where? United States this evening or London, Nigeria? London, yes. And I think most of you, a lot of you know Uche already. He's a colorful man. When he speaks, you will see why I use that word. He was born in Nigeria, grew up in Nigeria, started his working life in Nigeria, and then became a Wall Street banker. And then he made so much money that he compared his personal wealth to the GDP of some of the African nations. <laughs> and he decided it's time, time to come back and give back some of it. So Uche's last known position, known position was he was the chairman and CEO of Nigeria's Sovereign Investment Authority, which is Nigeria's and Africa's largest sovereign wealth fund. So Uche, I would just like you to share with the audience your journey, just in a couple of minutes, reel off how you started and how you landed up in where you are, not necessarily in Capital Club, but generally speaking. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjeev. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Um, my journey was um, actually a little bit circuitous because I started off, I uh, studied chemical engineering in Nigeria at a university called University of Port Harcourt. And I had gone to university at the time when my father thought the best thing for me was to be a doctor and I told him I was afraid of blood. And it was a very, very interesting conversation. Uh, but it took a while because I was also very young when I went to university, I was 15. So he, he didn't think I knew enough to make a decision about what I need to study, but I knew enough to go to university. So that was a very mm -hmm. interesting uh, back and forth. So I ended up studying chemical engineering. And part of it was somebody mentored me into thinking about chemical engineering, and I thought I liked it, so I did that. 
chemical engineering, um, coming out of school, the continent, the country was changing. You couldn't get a job, really. The only jobs you could find was in finance. And everybody was transitioning from engineering to accounting to finance. This was uh, 85 to 90. So I had a professor who said to me, um, it looks like you care about this as well in the class. Why don't you try for one of the accounting firms? So I went to Pricewaterhouse and Arthur Anderson. I got both of them. Ended up in Arthur Anderson, which has now become KPMG. Um, started working in Lagos. Now, I had grown up in a provincial town. Coming to Lagos to work was the first time I was actually ever coming to Lagos. And the shock, it's still as shocking today as it was back <laughs> in 1990. Um, it was a very interesting experience. But Lagos taught me two things, which has actually proved to be very useful later in my career. I lived in what they call the mainland and walked on the island, which meant the following. You wake up at 4 a.m., you have to be in your car by 5, you get to the office by 6.30. If you miss that timeline, you're getting to work by 10. Um, so that proved useful much later in life, and I'll tell you why. From there, Harvard Business School later on um, in 1996, after HBS, went to Goldman Sachs Asset Management in London. Again, first time going to London, which is a very interesting career. Was lucky with that because I ended up covering initially chemical sector, then I started covering tech and was one of the co-managers of the first tech fund set up by Goldman in London. I, I couldn't tell whether I was smart, I was lucky, but the market did very well and I thought I was smart. <laughs> then the first bear market in 2001, I was like, thank you very much, I'm done. Um, I'm leaving the buy side. Um, not quite like that because I got hired to then run the semiconductor research team for JP Morgan and rose very quickly through that, became managing director in 2001 um, and did that for six years, then went to the US with UBS to run the uh, research team, semiconductor research team globally. Um, so from UBS, one afternoon I got a call from a headhunter saying, hey, there's this mm -hmm. thing being set up in Nigeria called the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Nigeria. Are you interested in being CEO? I said, no. <laughs> he said, no, think about it. No, you must think about it. And uh, it took quite a while of, you know, of convincing. And I said, okay, I'll submit my CV. Why don't we talk about it? So I had no real interest at the time. But, and I allowed the process to go through. So, and funny enough, got into the panel, didn't know anybody there, which was very good because it allowed me an opportunity to actually evaluate the process. So that's how I became CEO of the Nigeria Sovereign Investment Authority. Uh, started the organization, it was just me, I, a lot of people built it. But Sashi is another very, very interesting person. She grew up in South Africa. I think she was born there. She did her education there. And most of her working life till around eight or nine years back was in South Africa. Today, she is a managing partner for Ernst & Young's Global Talent. Sashi, just tell us, the audience, your story. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. <laughs> I feel in really illustrious company, so thank you for that. Um, I grew up in South Africa, and you asked me to share a little bit about my career journey. And I think, you know, a career, especially if you're coming from Africa, is always made up of lots of hard work, lots of sacrifice, but 90% is luck and timing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big part of it, undoubtedly. And, uh, you know, I grew up in apartheid South Africa, and... Uh, I was fortuitous enough that the year I finished school, 1993, was the year that Nelson Mandela was released from prison. And before that, you know, South Africans that were non-white didn't really have the opportunity to even dream about careers like the one that I have, because the opportunities in the skilled labor market were just not there. So you went through <laughs> school and you also knew that you had, you know, parents and grandparents that were extremely intelligent, extremely smart, but ended up doing really nothing with their lives, if you think about the potential that they had, in terms of they just weren't the opportunities that were there. So the year I finished school, Nelson Mandela gets released from prison. The next year, universities across the country open up to people of all races, and I get a scholarship to attend university. And that's what I mean so much of this is about timing. And it just comes back to that statement you made initially about opportunity and how opportunity or the lack of opportunity can make such a big difference just in the tra trajectory that your life follows. Uh, I ended up studying uh, a BCom degree, majoring in information technology, because my uncle told me that's the only way I was going to get a job. 
So whether I liked information technology or not didn't matter. <laughs> I studied IT. Uh, I graduated from Natal University in South Africa, and I joined uh, a multinational company, Unilever, a fantastic organization. I had tremendous experiences with them, and just so thankful that some of these big corporates do choose to set up in Africa and you know establish businesses in Africa because that's what really gives people opportunities as well. You know, it's a push and pull. It's a tug of war because there's pluses and minuses to that. Uh, in that, a lot of the money ends up going back <laughs> to the European headquarters, etc. But at least there's opportunity that's created. I had a fantastic experience with Unilever. I then joined PwC. Most of my career was in IT in the SAP space. Uh, I then went to Europe. I lived in Europe for about four or five years, also implementing SAP across Europe. Came back and joined. Ernst and Young in 2005, uh, and built up their implementation assurance business across Africa. And the biggest thing I could see was that, you know, no matter what system you put into an organization, it was about that organization's readiness for change, the leadership, the willingness to change, to embrace, and to use that technology as a competitive advantage. And that comes down to the culture. And so I really wanted to get into the talent side, the human resources side, the organizational development side. Um, I joined Nedbank as an HR director, and then I got a call back from EY. They said, "Okay, we can see you're serious about this talent and people thing. We'll take you back." So I rejoined EY. Uh, I became the head of talent for Africa, and later got promoted to the head of talent for Europe. I mean, for EMEA, Europe, Middle East, India, and Africa. Uh, and that's when I moved to Dubai about nine years ago. Uh, I did that role for eight years, and just in the last year, I've moved into a new role. Uh, I'm with our consulting business, again across EMEA, but looking after quality and delivery excellence for all of our large high-risk programs. Um, so Thank every you. day is stressful, but good. <laughs> if that's not a versatile lady in front of you, I don't know who is, <laughs> right? Uh, so that's great. Uh, Paul, let me come to you. Now, Paul actually originally comes from Uganda. And uh, while he's not responsible for a lot of the stuff that Uganda has been accused of, He's certainly <laughs> been witness to a lot of it, right? So, Paul, just tell the audience quickly your story and uh, what brings you to Dubai, or how did you? And by the way, there are not too many legal firms that Paul hasn't been a partner of. Okay? <laughs> because when I look at my contacts list and look for Paul, he appears in every search. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I think my, my career journey is a bit more um, unplanned, and it was pretty much due to adversity. Um, having been born in Uganda, I think my first venture outside Uganda was again adversity. It was the time round about Idi Amin was coming into power. So within a year of my birth, I was sent to the Soviet Union, again by force. Well, not me, but, uh, but my parents. Um, and then spent the next five years in the, the vast uh, part of the Soviet Union and, as, uh, and Eastern Europe. And then again, as everybody was sort of running away and either being killed, moved uh, to Kenya uh, and then got educated uh, in Kenya. And uh, as anybody who's lived in Nairobi, there was a period during various leaders that you have to um, apply for work permits and student permits and so on. So it was permanently adversity every year going and wondering, are they going to reject you? So towards the end of uh, my school life, which was uh, A-levels, Again, I thought, what am I going to do? Uh, and I was then dispatched off to the next place that would accept us, which was the UK. Um, I didn't have a choice in what I studied. It was forced upon me. You, you study a profession. Uh, my first choice was obviously to do politics and international relations, at which point my father said, look at him, uh, being uh, jerked around by leaders. Um, and it was not going to feed you overseas. So I was forced to do law, having been a failed scientist. Um, and uh, stayed there for my university law at uh, University of Reading, qualified there, and then started looking for a job, uh, work permit process, where you could get two years to do your, your, um, your, your, your training. And that's what I did. Then I wondered what I'm going to do next. So um, uh, it's a point I'll bring up probably later in terms of how some of the, the, the international law firms and companies are structured is that there is always an artificial ceiling somewhere. Um, and I thought, well, let me pick somewhere else to go, because I really wanted to qualify as a, an MA lawyer. And it was almost impossible to, to get, in those days, 
a project finance or a corporate job to the Channel Islands. Uh, you didn't know that. Um, and uh, decided to... I knew, th I know they didn't keep you there. That, that <laughs> <laughs> they kept me there because I, I completed a statistic. I was the only black on the island <laughs> out, out of 60,000. So I think the other one be, has been sort of kicked out from one of the banks. Um, so I stayed there until um, I think that gave me some value. And then I was, uh, again, poached by uh, a firm in London, by Denton's, which said, we're quite interested in this place called Africa which I'm sure a lot of you people will be familiar with when somebody says, this place called Africa. So I then started up the Africa practice at Denton's in 98. Um, and uh, what I loved about that is that you somehow knew a bit more than everybody else. Um, so you were always <laughs> able to, to, you're not competing with anybody. Yeah. Built up uh, one of the, probably the initiatives I felt probably most proud of was to establish an alliance with, uh, with firms across Africa. I think we reached 21 countries because I was denied a budget to set up an office in, in, in Africa itself. And so I came, I moved over to Dubai with uh, Denton's, uh, again, trying to integrate the entire Far East and Asian practice, in effect, acting for international investors going into Africa. And then moved to Simmons, where again, uh, I think I was ahead of everybody else in understanding this place called Africa and built up their energy practice in Africa. And now, finally, I'm at a firm called Curtis Malay. There is a reason why I keep moving, is because when I feel um, I'm perhaps a threat to people, or people feel ah, it's about time that we shelved Africa, I move on. Uh, but constantly moving and moving with your clients and charting your own path. I think that's probably the key statement to try and constantly be moving before you are moved, if so I can put that. So, you know, Paul, thanks for that, because I think what we have established so far from all of your stories is the, the, the fact that right time, right place matters, but also the adversity that, that you've had to go through and endure. And I think couched in everything you said, if I may paraphrase, is the issue of prejudice that you faced in some form or the other, right? Now, you know, uh, I don't know which movie it was or which cartoon I saw. But there was this brilliant little piece I remember where this guy was saying that why doesn't the Western world like dictators? Because we are always accused in the African continent that there is an issue about democracy and dictators. And the guy kind of talks about the fact that if you had dictators, this would be the advantages. One is you would have a rigged election. The other would be that you would have a media to manipulate. The other would be that you would make sure your friends didn't pay taxes. The other also being that you could take your, get your friends out of jail when you became the president of the country, <laughs> right? Now, obviously, this is a tongue-in-cheek type of attack, if you like, on the perception challenge that we have, that what is good for the goose is very often not good for the gander sort of thing. So what I really want to come in and, and probe you guys on and keep your answers brief is there you are, Uche, a little country boy from the interiors of Nigeria. Lagos overawed you. Then you went to London. Then you went to New York and did what you did. Tell the audience a little bit about the, the perceived and the real prejudices that you faced and how you managed them. Because there is a learning here. I think the first thing that strikes you growing up in Nigeria and Luckily for me, also rising very quickly, because what I didn't mention was I was lucky to be financial controller of a bank that ended up becoming successful, uh, Diamond Bank. I did that at 23. And you are, and I graduated top of my class, yes, of course. And, but you are, I have always seen myself somewhat as, my parents may not be wealthy, but I was intellectually, in my opinion, an elite out of 120 million people. So I never, really recognized a lot of the prejudices, even when they existed. I remember one of my bosses when I joined Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Um, initially, when I walked in there, just to give you an idea, I had never traded a stock in my life before I took that job. So I hadn't really understood what the job meant. Um, but at the same time, I was the first in my class we made a, a VP, and I was the first in my class we made a managing director. And there were many reasons for that. But my boss then, I remember, he saw rest in peace, Danny Truel. Um, he was he did past chairman of Wellcome Trust. 
Danny said to me, look, Uche, let's have a frank conversation. There'll be people that will not be very comfortable about who you are. Everything you do will be extrapolated. If you do well, you need to do very well to be recognized. Mm. If you do badly, whatever you do, no matter how little, will be extrapolated and you look like you killed someone. So let's manage the risk, <laughs> um, which is a very first thing. By the way, this is something that only a friend will tell you. And Danny was one of those. Danny and the guy called David Blood, many of you know David Blood. David Blood runs Generation Investment Management, who, by the way, was exceptional in changing the course of my career. I met David Blood coming out of the gym at Harvard Business School, and I had decided to go work for somebody called Booz Allen and Hamilton at the time, out of many offers I had. And David convinced me to try Goldman and try banking and, and really mentored my career at very early stages. But that statement stuck with me. Um, and further on, David said to me, Uche, do, don't do the following two things. Don't be the Africa guy in banking. Because at the moment, we see Africa as an asset class. There was nothing, there was no difference between Nigeria and Gabon and Congo. There was no difference between Africa equities and debts or commodities or currency, none. It is one asset class. It goes out of favor, your career is done. Take the most difficult thing and do it, was what he said to me. And which was kind of what led me to tech and semiconductors and people in the room to like test. Semiconductor at the time was very difficult. Uh, still is to some extent. Now, back to this whole point about 4 a.m. wake up and Lagos and all that. You bring a lot of capacity. Endurance. And endurance. And just to be there. Stamina. And mm -hmm. Listen, you know, um, and that helped in some ways. But that statement never left me. Um, and this is why today, you know, we've had FTX, we've had Terranos, we've had WeWork, we had all kinds of, we had Madoff in this generation. But there is still the benefit of doubt given to an American entrepreneur that may not be given to an African entrepreneur. It is fact. Um, but how you deal with it is a, I, mean, I was making a joke yesterday, I said, you know, of all the perception about fraud in Africa, made of, you know, just one. It's more than multiples, others of magnitude more than anything you've ever heard of. But no one gives it any concern. So there is still that perception. I think, you know, there's a wonderful TED talk on this around the danger of a single story. And I think that's what we get caught up in, you know, that we don't have enough narratives around African success, around women's success, or whatever we're talking about, that create you know, multiple stories so that they are alternatives. And this is why you have this effect of either the magnifying glass or the megaphone that you're carrying around with you, right? And everything's either scrutinized or if you do well, there's also, you know, uh, the, 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 the megaphone that you have. So it also creates an amplification effect. I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a challenging situation. But I do think, you know, this adversity that coming back to the point raised, this adversity does strengthen you in many ways. It either kills you or it strengthens you. Mm. And I remember one of the conversations when I first got onto the EMEA executive because I was the only female, I was the only person under 40, and I was the only black person in the room. And we're sitting in a room of about 20 people. And um, I delivered my presentation. We had a very, I thought, honest session. I came out of there and my boss came and he apologized to me and he said, Sesh, I am so sorry. That was just a bloodbath. I should have prepared you for that. And I was thinking, what are you talking about? It felt like a very normal conversation. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and that's because you just get so used to going uphill all the time that you sometimes don't even realize it, right? So we can take a lot of these things for granted and think, oh, if there's a few successful people, that means it's okay. But it actually isn't the average experience. So we just have to be cognizant of that as well. So I think what you're really saying uh, is that somehow the realities of, of, of growing up, the way you all have, uh, creates a very deep strength and probably an acceptance that things are not meant to be easy. Things are meant to be fought for rather than be given to you. What do you see the young African talent as? Do you see them uh, because they are the sons of Uche, taking things a bit easy? Or do you see the same uh, embracing of adversity as a way to success being very much there in the minds and hearts of these people? Or are you think, do you think that the current generation is getting a little spoiled 
or probably of feeling a little more entitled? Oh, that's a loaded, loaded question. I think, um, let me touch on something else first. I think that if you, if you focus too much on, on prejudice and you focus too much on hurdles, you will get pretty much nowhere. Um, as my first job where I was out of a thousand lawyers, I think we were three from blacks or three actually who happened to be from Africa itself. So, and I was also far too lazy to, to take the route of, of, of working twice as hard. Why should I? Um, just be smarter. Um, so I focused much more on looking for the gaps and looking for something that doesn't slow you down because you will not, uh, to work twice as hard is just, is just silly because there are 100 other people working twice as hard. I mean, there are 24 hours in a day. <laughs> I think in order to become uh, a recognized uh, trainee lawyer, you had to have done three nights in a row, three 24-hour, um, sort of pretty much not 48 hours, but just staying in the office for three days in a row. I won't, I won't disclose what I was doing, but it included things like photocopying and faxing <laughs> papers. And at some point, sitting and just saying, don't go home and wait until you're given what to do. But I think touching on your second point of you know, today's talent and, and, and African talent, I think it's, um, it's, it, it's, again, not good to sort of focus on where this talent is. That talent will come to you. I found that uh, every day I probably get two or three messages from people, from young lawyers or young or students, and they don't tend to come from the entitled. They tend to come from very, very uh, ambitious people who maybe used unorthodox ways of getting into the system. Um, and I admire those, uh, one of whom I remember approached me um, and just kept on walking into reception and saying, I'm not leaving this office. And he's now, um, you know, at one of the largest New York law firms as one of the youngest ever partners, um, just by not giving up. So I find that entitlement we don't have time for entitlement. I think, um, I'm sure I'd speak for, for, for the other panelists, is that there are enough people, very hungry, gutsy, they're sitting in Dubai or they're sitting in, in Lagos or Kampala or, or Kigali, and they will, they will hound you. And I like being hounded. Uh, and those are the people I give chances because you know, we were given chances, all of us. It's, as I think you said earlier, mm -hmm. there's a lot of luck and a lot of um, things. So yes, it is about finding your own path finding the easiest target, the easiest route. Um, and if you can craft your own way to make yourself valuable, that may be like I did. I always wanted to be a corporate lawyer. I wanted later to be an oil and gas lawyer. I eventually wanted to be um, an infrastructure lawyer because I saw what was going on in Africa. And I realized if you try to join the projects group of this and this law firm, you will fail. Mm -hmm. So what I did is to establish an Africa practice which enabled me to do all those things. This issue of how you became what you became. A lot of it had to do with luck, yes. A lot of it had to do with your own ambitions, yes. A lot of it had to do with the resilience that you developed because of the way things were. But a lot of it was about global companies picking you up, training you, grooming you, and then giving you the confidence, right? Is that happening in a structured way? Or is it still very much a brain drain type of syndrome rather than a development type of syndrome for, hmm. for African talent. Because it, it stands to reason, isn't it, that on the African continent, we need to be able to either retain or bring back good talent so that Africa develops. So where do you see the, the magic portion here? Okay. Uh, okay, let me, I'm going to keep this answer brief because I think it's, um, it's evolved and I have seen it evolve. Um, at the very beginning, and I was very lucky to have also gone into Wall Street at a time when I remember being at a university, a business school, when the affirmative action decision was being taken in America to actually give an opportunity for people, other people to come in. Of course, that's back in the courts now, but that created an opportunity for a lot of people. But even then, it wasn't happening much. Um, the way it happened for me and I mentioned the name of a gentleman called David Blood, and I saw that through uh, many um, other places that I worked. You needed a sponsor. There's somebody who took an interest and said, look, okay, I'm going to work with this guy, and I'm going to help him. 
And I was lucky to have found almost through every stage of my career, someone who took an interest or someone with whom I developed a relationship who helped and guided, even if it's saying, try and avoid mistakes. And there were specific mistakes that said, avoid this, avoid this, and avoid that. Um, and that helped. Um, but I think that was direct mentorship. I think what I saw uh, in my final period as you know, managing direct, as uh, quite senior at UBS, was a far more structured approach now. To people coming in, first of all, we're admitting more than we did back in 1996. Um, admitting more people, and they're coming as part of a class. It's a much more connected world now. I, I look at Harvard Business School, I think there was a time there were just a handful of us. Now they're like dozens um, coming from African continents who have a business school. So there is now, in my opinion, a, a developing structure around it. Okay. And I must give credit to a lot of the corporates who have also gone a little bit beyond. But I think also you're seeing people given an opportunity. I never thought I would see a day credit Suisse will appoint a black person as CEO. That just didn't think like something that could happen. And we might debate whether I worked out well or didn't work out well, but the point was that there was a chance to actually get it done. Mm -hmm. It is happening, but it is still more uh, bilateral than it is structured and group-wise. And I think we need to get to that point where it becomes more uh, structural. But it's a bit more than that, isn't it? Because there is what? Going to be 2 billion African people mm -hmm. the next sort of by the next decade. And 70% of them, we know, is more or less going to be at the age of around 19, 20 or less. So it's a bit more than just picking talent that you need for your own plans in Africa and quite another thing for the global companies to see it as a talent pool, Correct. period, mm -hmm. right? Do you see that thought process building up that it is not about Africans for Africa, it is about talent for the world? And how do you, how do, you do that or how do you make that happen? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If, if we project that, right, by 2030, I think it's 42% of the global youth are going to come from Africa. Good. But if you look at the average age of um, the average African, they're 25, whereas Europe or Japan are at like 48, 47, and those markets are declining, right? So in those markets, we have to rely on a lot on automation, uh, those type of things. Now, when we look at Africa, something else is happening. I don't think young Africans need to rely on these corporate opportunities to, or, or you know, that opportunity to go to university in the same way that we have to, because you know, opportunity is being democratized in a way like never before. They can learn themselves, they can interact on the internet. They're not waiting to go to Harvard before they start their businesses. They're starting their businesses now. And even if 10% of that population has that grit and that determination and that willingness to succeed, I think that they're gonna do it. Uh, and if you look at the startups that are starting in Africa, the leapfrogging that's happening in terms of technology and innovation, and you now start to couple that with maybe a global awakening that Africa has been raped for a very long time. Mm. And it's now time for African countries to start collaborating, connecting, thinking about, we have the people, we have the resources, we have you know, the, the temperate climate, we, we have the location. How do we bring all of that together? And yes, that could be a huge advantage for the rest of the world if they think about it strategically. It's not just about extracting resources. Great point. Mm -hmm. Essentially, stop looking at Africa as a problem child, but as a solution to a lot of the world's problems. Be it the energy deficit we have in the world, Absolutely. be it the food deficit we have in the world, and be it the resource deficit we have in the world, the skills deficit, correct? And that paradigm shift is crucial. It's not so much, I think, even the corporates that help you, that, that give you um, the opportunities at times uh, to progress. It's the individuals within mm -hmm. those corporates. Um, there are people who take a punt on you. There are people who are, who in some way, I mean, one thing you know, we can all understand about prejudice is that it's at different levels. Um, you know, whether it's at national level, at religious level, that when some of us have been through everything, you know, um, you know, the irony is I actually found through school life there was far less uh, prejudice than, than, than when you enter the working life. But it's individuals within those corporates that um, just just seem to give you maybe not the leg up, but actually it's the, the opportunity. And, I, and, and that's when I said the times to be strategic is important because you latch on to those. Those become semi-mentors for you. 
um, rather than perhaps the person who's, uh, you know, forgive me, especially sometimes in some of these big companies you have in HR, they will say, I'm going to give you a mentor when you come in. That's the person I do not want um, because that's the person who has volunteered to steer the company through some odd uh, strategic direction. Um, so yes, I, I think it's, it's, it's individual. I just want to highlight the, the role of, and Uche has touched on, on some of the role of individuals that, that, have, that have played a part, uh, not so much the institution. It may, in fact, it may have been against the interests of the institution. So Tom Griffin, I'm the partner responsible for a company called Control Risks. So we have um, eight offices across Africa, about 500 staff. Um, I guess maybe I want to ask a question as yeah. opposed to make a comment. Um, so and the question is for, for you, I guess, from a sort of consulting point of view. So as I say, we have 450, 500 staff across the region. We have really strong um, retention rates, um, particularly at the more sort of senior level. But at the more junior levels, we have a horrible competition for talent. Either we have staff who are being captured from Canada um, or UK or wherever else, um, but we're sort of really struggling to sort of retain the more junior staff who will ultimately be top talent and evolving talent for the organization. So I just wondered if there's anything from a sort of practical or tactical point of view uh, that you might recommend. So, you know, one of the things we do in consulting is we almost take that and, and run with it because it's like, you know, our slogan is no matter where, when you join or whenever you leave, we want your time with us to be the best time in your career. Because we almost know that these people are going to spend one, two, three, four years with us and they're going to go on to do other things. But how do we maintain a lifetime relationship with them, I think, becomes very important. And so becoming a feeder, because your, what your organization is, it's a feeder, right? Because you're developing, you're training, you're investing in people and then they're going on into the diaspora and maybe they come back at a later stage, et cetera, but you have to continuously invest. And so, you know, the graduate recruitment programs that, that we invest and in do, the scholarships, the funding, to keep that funnel going. And it's also then starts to feed your leverage and your pyramid models ultimately. So we work on a 80% retention rate. We expect 20% of our people to leave us annually. And if they don't, we run into financial difficulties. <laughs> So you, it's almost like embracing it and then saying, how do I keep the pipeline going? How do I continue to invest? And the young people coming out of graduate schools are phenomenal. They are amazing. They, they continue to just impress, add value. The, the way they're able to connect and work is completely different from the previous generation. And so I think having them in the workplace becomes really special as well. And maybe same question for you, H.A., because you sort of built, almost built a high-performing organization almost from scratch. So interested to hear your perspectives. I will say the following. My perspective is actually a little bit different. And I once had a staff town hall where I said, listen, if you want to go anywhere, let me know. I'll write a recommendation for you. But it will go. And... On the one hand, I want you to ensure that, you know, and was, my whole mantra has been conditioned in my days also working for Arthur Anderson, uh, which was, you know, people you meet in your career, they'll either end up being your client, your competitor, your collaborator, so you have mm -hmm. to treat them well. Um, and so I actually have had occasions where I've gone to my staff, like, what are you still doing? Or, where's your application to go to Columbia? Oh, but I'll sign it. Um, one of my staff got a job at um, uh, Federal Reserve in Boston from Nigeria. And I thought it was quite interesting that someone sat in Lake Oswa Abuja and I applied for a job at Federal Reserve. I think I was the only one in the office who was excited for him because my head of HR was like, stop, 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 stop. I said, no, 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 no. First, we need to saturate, create a certain pipeline of people. They will come back. They will come back. Or they share the narrative. Or they share the narrative. Or at least at the minimum, it encourages everybody else to aspire. They realize for you to have those roles, you have to bring a certain quality of life. It's going to happen whether you like it or not anyway. You might as well embrace it, like you said. I think that's a very important point. Embrace it. But that also forced us at NSIA to now create a very strong pipeline of people through our graduate analyst program. We didn't have that before, but once we started to see the trend, 
business school, going to Canada. I mean, there are departments that just disappeared. Um, especially in IT, medicine, these are areas that are being targeted quite aggressively. IT in particular is the one that affected us. But we said, okay, you know what? Instead of hiring two, three people in IT, we'll hire 10 on the assumption that half will leave. And I think at the end of the day, that is actually creating a big opportunity pool. But I think resisting it will just be um, not counterproductive. A lot of what we are talking about ultimately has to assume something. That is that there is a steady group of quality graduates coming out of the continent. Now, do you, how do you see the current education system largely in Africa at the primary level and also at obviously the secondary and university level? Are they deteriorating? Is there limited investment? What needs to give? Because at the end of the day, the demographic dividend is only going to be realized if the basic preparatory levels are solid, right? Otherwise, you will struggle. Your view on that, Paul? I think the education institutions will, at least even now, and certainly for, the, for, for, for my lifetime, have been um, always producing and churning out uh, quality graduates. Um, I know that. I experience it. Um, I was one of those who could not get into those universities, and that's why I went overseas. Uh, because I could not get into either Makere University in Uganda or, 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 or University of Nairobi in Kenya. So they are churning out. What I find is a problem is, is utilizing the graduates. There's too many graduates coming out and their only option is to, is to look for jobs in the country. And those jobs just aren't there. Uh, we've got to find a way in which um, they're able, these bright guys who come out like any other graduate around the world, to be able to really have the world as their as their as their as, as their you know find as their training ground, and that's where I find there is a problem. Um, I find that the world is not ready to embrace this talent, um, and and I at times encourage um, African graduates um, to to look at the continent. That's the other thing which I have a lot of criticism at times from my my, my fellow African graduates is. They want to go to London, they want to go to the US, they want to go to Canada. And I say, it's the country next door. Have you tried that? Or, or there, is, there is, you know, we have 35 sub-Saharan, another 25 in, in North Africa. <coughs> have you tried that? Um, so I find that um, it, it, it's a shame that if the, the, the Western world, particularly where the world, you know, the opportunities are for the brightest, um, I think is important. I think... Uh, we, it's just it's just very very difficult, and I think as a result, if you know how the working world operates, it operates very much on experience. Okay, they want to find out how many years. Where are you coming from? Uh, London, in particular, is one that if you start in the right place, you just continue. Um, and the minute you divert, whether it's to go and do a, a master's or do whatever, you're out of sync. You become, well, you know, you're not going to be able to fit in because this person has a PhD and everybody else doesn't. Um, this person is 35, the other is 29. So at least certainly with law firms, this is what I see. So I think we've just got to find a way of, of um, the talent is there, the graduates are there, there are hundreds coming out, but they just aren't getting the opportunities to, to nurture that talent into, into a, you know, a profitable because ultimately, you know, companies want you to make money for them. So, Uche, you want to add to that? Yeah, I actually wanted to add, I think you, you have a good point about the education system, particularly in a place like Nigeria. Uh, but I also think addressing that some things have happened recently or happening, is I think it's very, very important. And perhaps use as a platform to encourage more of that to happen. Let me start with the primary school. Uh, we realized one of the investments that I'm most proud of that we made at NSIA was in something called Bridge International Academy. Um, and Bridge's done a phenomenal job of using technology to educate children of the really, really poor people. And the curriculum gets centrally sent from Washington, D.C. Every teacher has a smartphone, has an iPad. And they actually teach these kids, and I'm talking about children of the domestic staff, they teach them almost the same curriculum. And what has transpired is the grade levels, and we watch them, but reading math, the two or three places where we've had that been really, truly top-notch, is some of the alumni need to come back and, and I think it's the message I want to give to the African alumni. Come back and help the schools that they attended. Uh, more recently, my high school, we came together, 
raised a lot of money, we rebuilt the entire high school. We took it off from the government and we hired a headmaster from South Africa, hired teachers from outside the country and made that investment. And it was done by the alumni. Think more of that and endowments coming, and I'm hoping that that helps. But to one point that you made, as the third point I want to make is, I'm seeing more people self-train using technology. They're mm -hmm. attending open universities and they're coming out. Like, Where did you learn all this? Well, I learned it on Coursera. I learned it attending, uh, what's that Google One signature or something? I don't know what that's called. But they all go to all these places and they learn things. And a lot of that is coming. And I think the most important thing now is to give all of them an opportunity to express that talent. This is where the challenge really is. My name is Abdullah Tukaram from the Nigerian Consulate. Uh, I would first of all commend you know, holding this um, August event because literally it's doing half of my work for me at the moment because um, part of my work here is to attract foreign direct investment to Nigeria. But I must say that um, at the moment, um, the challenges have never been as much as this because of the, you know, bad stereotyping, you know, misconceptions and what have you. Uh, I agree with you that there are a lot of talents in Africa, especially um, the untapped potentials of our teaming youth. So, but um, my question here is, how do we change that narrative? How, wh where should we hit sort of the nail on the head to change that narrative and attract more people to come and invest in Africa? Hold that question. I want to come to the lady there as well and take your question. Yes. And then maybe we can... Come to you, and then we can okay. answer. Yeah. Of course. First, this is so nice to to see uh, this event happening. Um, but I will. You said don't chase them and don't give them hard time. But why not? It starts from asking question, right? Sure. You've mentioned come back to Africa. Yes. What is the plat the platform that you are preparing for, for people who finish education outside, finish to PhD, master's degrees. What's the advice from the expert? What is the best uh, platform that you have prepared for African students who study abroad to come back? Thank you. For those of you who don't know, she herself uh, probably in that category of people. So, <laughs> so we're going to have to help you. Huh? I'm, I'm going <laughs> to come back to give, Africa. Give a little, yes. <laughs> but we'll, we'll answer that. And we'll take another question and yeah. then we'll come back to the panel. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hello, everyone. So I work for a global healthcare platform. Uh, we own hospitals in Kenya and Nigeria. And I just wanted to comment on the whole talent situation. We have a problem with talent retention from clinicians and others, but mostly clinicians, because of the lifestyle that they seek. So people who are well-educated, who got their degrees from abroad, they don't want to come and live in the countries. They seek, uh, they have an aspiration for a different type of living. And I'm not sure I want to congratulate talent that gets drained out of Africa and goes to the Middle East because we see that the countries need those talents inside the countries. So how would like the country or the government like create this kind of infrastructure that keeps those talent within the country and, and have them have the lifestyle they need? Because pay... I know that the pay is not a problem because we pay like an international level, but still they don't like the lifestyle in their own country. And, and then you end up in a talent drain. So I, I think it's my question would be like, how do we create an environment or even an association of talent retention within African countries? Thank you. Uh, before I come to the panel to answer those three questions, I, I would encourage any one of you to try and answer these as well, if you want to share anything. It's up to you to make a comment on anything that has been said. Uh, but is any, are there any volunteers to try and answer the questions that's been raised? Because there were really three questions. One was, how do we manage the narrative and, and make people hear and understand the opportunities? The other was almost the, the sort of flip side of that question, then how can I go back to Africa? What's the, what's the way to go back? And then your question is very, very fascinating. And you make an interesting point. You're saying that pay-wise, you're paying them global salaries. I'm not entirely sure that's always true. But somehow people are not choosing the lifestyle or the, let's call it the environmental challenges. Quality of life. Yeah, that's <laughs> Thank so you. <laughs> any, anybody who wants to take any of these questions? 
a hard question. Yeah, please, uh, Sashin, you want to? Yeah, go? you know, a couple of things. The one thing we're starting to see, which is an alarming trend for me, is lots of countries are closing their borders and trying to recruit only people from within that country. So it's almost a mentality of our country first type of thing that's starting to, to come through. And I think that's very dangerous when it comes to talent, because I think it's that diversity of talent that drives innovation. Mm -hmm. you know? And when we move talent around the world, we can see the impact of these diverse teams and what that does. And even with people leaving, I've got one of, my, uh, one of the ladies in my team who's in London at the moment and wants to go back to Kenya now because of family situation, etc. But the thing is, she's going back with a whole lot more experience and knowledge that's really going to enrich that team back in Kenya now. So we need to be able to make these moves possible, more and more possible as global organizations. It alarms me that we are so getting so restricted in terms of work permits, uh, numbers, different agendas in, you know, moving people, because I think that is really going to stifle development mm. in the long term. And I think that's not what Africa needs right now, because they are the ones producing the mm. talent, producing the people. They've got more people than jobs. So they really need the world to embrace African talent. And I think a big portion of their talent may return back or may not return back. But either way, it's still a plus. It's still going to be a win. So the insularity of of, of, the the insularity, yeah. and even within African countries, first and foremost, African countries need to accept people from other African countries Which is the point and strengthen that collaboration. You know, so that's the first barrier that needs to be broken down. Okay. Yeah. Can I can I add something here? I, I think we have to accept that there will be a gap period where the best talents get drained out before we're able to replace them. That's unfortunate, but that's just fact. Um, and I'm hoping that what, you know, you might want to describe it as an osmotic effect where that happens, people see talented people who have trained or trained themselves or somehow get hired off, and then they are able to now try and do the same thing and aspire to become like that person. That creates a bigger pool of people that get trained. But I'm looking at this as an investment. Earlier today, I was having a conversation and we were, you know, we had invested in a couple of healthcare programs in Nigeria. And the first challenge we had was built a cancer treatment center and we couldn't find qualified physicists who could run them. And we went around and we ended up hiring from Egypt. Thank you very much. They did a phenomenal job, but what they did was within two, three years, they trained the Nigerians to come to the point where they've taken over. Um, and I realized there was a pool an opportunity here to invest. And they say, nursing was another area we saw gap. And I said to myself, hang on a minute, you know, this is an incredible investment opportunity. How about we train these people? Look at what Cuba does with medicine. Cuba mm -hmm. earns, what, $16 billion from the people that go abroad to work? I'm not saying we employ that model, but the point here is what I see as an investor is actually a demand for talent, an opportunity to train that talent. Why don't we invest in it? Become a nursery for the world. Why not? Yes, mm -hmm. that's a great idea. I think it's Paul, you want to say something on this? Yeah, I mean, there are many things I want to say, and uh, some will be controversial. Please do. Um, the world and employers generally are looking for people who can do things. They are not some kind of charity. They are desperate. They don't like to say it. They say they want to recruit, you know, X hundred graduates. They want to exploit. They want to use, and you are a machine. The, the big challenge is who is going to invest in the training. Um, I know just speaking as a lawyer, it takes about four years for us to turn somebody, a graduate, into a profitable individual. That involves four years of investment. Um, one of the things I tried to implement was to lock in people uh, for a period of about eight years. And people thought, are you nuts? But for me, that's important. Uh, once upon a time, we used to, you know, you invest in their training, you pay for their degrees or their law schools, and then you pay, you pay their training, and you do this, then you stop. Because suddenly, you think, oh, we don't want all these people staying forever. But you, you, you've got to invest. Who is going to invest? 80% of my clients are governments, are African governments. And one of the things I get them to do is to take graduates locally and push them 
into organizations around the world, push them into governments around the world, get them that three to five to 10 years experience. They can do that because these same governments who are my clients, who are hiring and spending millions and millions of dollars hiring international law firms, international banks, international this, they're not training their own people. When you have that three to four years, you're able then to say, I'm bringing this. Um, and so, and I think the other thing I wanted to just highlight is whether you're a student or a young person looking to go home, you have to build a network. It is not your CV. You have to go around, disturb the Sanjeevs, the Sessionis, the Uches. You have to uh, really make a network of friends. We all know we get our jobs, we get our work through a network of friends. Uh, evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jared Kangwana from Clyde & Co, uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya. I think all of the comments that have been made today are, are useful and, and insightful. Um, but I think one thing we need to acknowledge and be conscious of is uh, Africa's growth trajectory is very, very different to um, what developed countries have, have, have gone through. So the models and processes that we are implementing for Africa do need to look quite different to what, uh, what the, 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 norm, the, uh, the norm may be. I take your point in terms of uh, retention and, and local talent retention. I would like to think about it and, and, and trying to figure out why that's an issue. I would, I would look at it in a slightly different way to, to, to get an answer to that and, and find a way to mitigate it and to look at uh, individuals who are moving back onto the continent. Why are they moving back onto the continent? Where are the opportunities? Because they do exist. So maybe let's look at it from a more positive angle uh, as opposed to a, to a negative position. I think there's an amazing opportunity with Africa, with the, with the talent coming through, with the potential, with the growth rates. And at the same time, we see those growth rates stagnating in the rest of the world. So there is a demand supply issue. At the same time, if we don't solve these challenges of youth in Africa and what are the opportunities for that youth, it's going to be a problem for the whole world. Yeah, right. So either we tackle this as an opportunity and say, let's invest, let's, let's get this going, let's take this challenge on, and let's make sure we use this talent for the benefit of Africa and the benefit of the world, or we create a massive problem. Because if we have millions of people growing up without opportunity, without education, without entrepreneurship, it's, it's a massive problem, not just for Africa, but for everyone. Absolutely. Well said. They'll come knocking at your doors without a passport. Right. Exactly. Okay. Here we go. Who wants to go next? Paul? Well, I, I think I'll just wrap up by saying um, the opportunities are there. African countries, African economies are growing. Uh, we see it uh, both on the inward and even the outside, out, but outward, outward bound uh, stuff. So, but I think we've got to invest, find a way of investing in the graduates that are pouring out of universities in Africa um, and, and seeing how we can train them. Africans, like everywhere else, will always go back. I point to Nigeria and, and Uche's country as one. It doesn't matter how high they go in London or New York, they will go back at their own will. And I'm seeing that in Kenya, I see it in many other places. They will go back. If the only tool you have is, say, hammer every problem is the, the nail, uh, I'm an investor, and I see this more as an investment opportunity. Um, the world has come to recognize African talent. First in tech. Now in medicine, you see a black doctor in New York or in San Francisco, maybe three out of 10 times, maybe no, three out of five times is probably Nigeria. Um, and if there's one area we have a competitive advantage now in America, it's actually medicine. And I'm seeing that more and more, and I'm seeing that in other places. The tech talent is now being recognized. Um, banking. Uh, banking is also being recognized. A whole department of one of the big, uh, big four firms just got hired up to Jersey. Um, so there is an acceptance and a recognition of the talent, and I think that's a very important first step. And these are African-born talent. These are non this Nigerian. Is they point. never went, never lived, never worked abroad, never went to school abroad. All just got hired and hoovered up. Um, I had a friend who said that a recruitment agency out of Netherlands hired his entire staff, stunned up with a bus, and took them to the airport. Um, so the good news is the talent is being recognised. So that's a good thing. As an investor. You know, all I see is an opportunity to actually invest in vocational training, in finishing schools, in educational program that brings them to a certain level. Five years ago, Nigeria received more from remittances than they received from oil. And it's been that for a very long time. I think right now, one can almost say, as small as it is, it's still, uh, it's now become our biggest export to people. 
the need for the world is still significant. And so personally, I see this as an area to invest in. My experience investing in this Bridge International Academy is now that's public, of course, because the company got acquired by Francisco Partners for significant, uh, something that was very decent for all of us. Uh, but the point is that there is an important opportunity here for Nigeria, for the rest of Africa, to actually now invest in developing this region. The talent has been recognized. Let's produce more of them. So, Uche, you know, thank you very much. And I'll just end by saying one very couple of simple things. One is, it's very sobering if you don't know this data point already, but it's very sobering to know that it, there are more people alive today in this world than has died in the history of human civilization. Hmm. It just tells you how many more people live today. Within the entire history of the world, there are more people alive today than have died. The second is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing, which we say in Lagos, which I'm entitled to say, that the rate of population growth in Nigeria is faster than the traffic. <laughs> so, so either make it a dividend, make it an opportunity, or as Heshni said, make it a problem. But the issue is the supply is there, the intent is there, the desire is there, the resilience is there. So let's make it work for the world's problem, which is human resource, isn't it? Thank you very much, everybody.